Hey everyone, John here for Nature Nerds Rule. The habitat behind me might give you some hint as to the focus of our next wildlife segment. Our very own mountain man, Armin Lapalm, who is instrumental in preserving a lot of the Mineral Hills conservation area where we're at right now, he calls them hedgehogs. But to the rest of us, they're known as the porcupine. Behind me are the wintering dens of the porcupine here in the Mineral Hills Conservation Area. I had the pleasure of going out tracking porcupines with two really great naturalists and wonderful nature nerd friends, Ted Watt and Molly Hale. But before we hit the trail with them, I want to just go over a little bit of their natural history to really investigate their biography, so to speak. So here's some information on the hedgehog, I mean the, the porcupine. The porcupine is one of our most beloved animals here in western Massachusetts, but it certainly isn't cuddly, with sometimes over 30,000 barbed quills on a large male porky. In Latin, porcus means swine and spina means thorn, which is why they were called quill pigs in colonial times. They are our second largest rodent after the beaver. Rodenta means gnaw in Latin, and gnaw they do, with a single pair of continuously growing incisors on the upper and lower jaw, helping them to eat hemlock buds and the inner bark, or cambium, of many trees. They are part of a group of rodents that rafted across the Atlantic from Africa to Brazil over 30 million years ago. These New World porcupines migrated to North America three million years ago when the Isthmus of Panama arose. Here's a porcupine den. There's a lot of dens around here. There's a, uh, oh, I'm slipping. It's icy. Um, so in the winter, porcupines like to go into dens because it's protected. Um, in the summer, they might just stay in a tree day and night, you know, all through the summer. And sometimes, even in the winter, they might be up in a hemlock tree if um, the tree has enough thermal protection uh, from the needles. And if the porcupine is big enough, that got a big body, body size to keep warm in the winter. But if it gets really cold, um, or if the porcupine is small, it's going to want to go into a den where it's protected in the winter. So they, they love these rock dens. Um, this rock den, it just goes way, there's all kinds of little crevices and hidey holes they go back in there, so when you peek in there, you can't see because uh, it goes down and then back up like that. But they're really well protected in there. If a predator like a fisher was to come in there after them, all they have to do is turn their back so that their back and their tail is facing the predator, and there's no way that they could be, um, you know, attacked in that position. So they're very safe, and it's warm in there too. And uh, lots of times there'll be more than one porcupine sharing a den. Um, sometimes as many as five. We once did a study out at Quabbin, um, and we found five porcupines sharing one hollow pine tree den that they would come to year after year after year after year. And when they start to crowd each other, they start, um, they make this noise. Um, it's a sound like uh, that they're really annoyed. They go, ah, 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 ah. Uh, <laughs> that you might hear when when one porcupine's crowding the other one too much and they're feeling a little annoyed. At least that's how I interpret it. Um, we actually heard that sound a few minutes ago in the other den over there. Maybe because we were annoying the porcupine. They were getting annoyed at us. They were getting annoyed, yeah. yeah. Like Molly said, porcupines love rock dens in the winter, but will den in rotten trees and even a dry culvert like this one at Marble Brook. You can usually tell a den because there is massive amounts of porky scat. They eat hemlocks and cambium, and it comes out as cashew-sized nodules. There's usually lots of quills at the entrance as well. So we've been following these porcupines through the fresh snow, and they're piling up in, in one sort of well-worn trail here, through the white pine and the scrub. And I'm thinking that they're headed up to a food supply someplace up this hill. But I don't know what it's, where, where it is or what it's going to be, but it's going to be fun to find out. So, Ted, how can you tell that they're porcupine tracks? Well, 
you can see it's a well-worn trail, so it's, it's, it's a pretty heavy-bodied animal, and they just keep walking in the same spot. They, they create a trail, and then they keep following it. And um, the tracks themselves are, are oval-shaped, and they, sometimes you can almost see the, the pad. They have a bare pad without fur on the base, on the bottom. And sometimes if you really look close, sometimes you can see a tail drag, too. Yeah, and we yeah. saw some quill, some places where the quills from the sides of the animal had dragged in the snow, too, and that's, that's a giveaway. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Let's go see where it goes. But don't touch him, John. No. <laughs> Can't I shake hands with him? Don't let them throw their quills at you. <laughs> oh, they don't throw their quills. Uh, they don't? No. Oh. <laughs> well, do you see this? This is porcupine pee, and you've got to smell it. You gotta get your nose right down in it like this. Oh my God, Ted! Really? Yeah, yeah. It's it's one of the nicest smells of any animal pee. <laughs> oh, oh, really? <laughs> and you've smelled a lot of animal pee, I've, right? <laughs> <laughs> it smells like a combination of turpentine and kind of a sweet scent to it—a sweet piney scent. Wow. Now, usually porcupines won't eat white pine, but they've been eating white pine here. Huh? They must be really hungry. They must be. I don't quite get that. Well, let's. Let's follow him a little further. I've never seen this before. Look at every, everything that's within reach has been clipped off. Yeah. Just the needles, not the twigs. Wow. That's really awesome. I've yeah. never seen it before. So these, these branches were clipped by a rodent, and it's most probably our porcupine. You see how it's at a slant here, like this. And if you look carefully, you can see little slits going across the slant. Each one of those was a bite mark by the incisors of the porcupine. And that's how you tell that this wasn't just broken by the wind, but it was actually chewed by an animal. Wow. These are gray birches that the pork is eating. Look at this hemlock right here. It's like, it looks like it's almost dead. It's got only a few little tiny branches out here that still have some live leaves on them, needles. But the rest of it, has, the porcupines have eaten everything off this tree. Um, because it's the closest tree to their den and it's the easiest one to get to. So this is the one they go to first and eat. Um, and if you can see the next hemlock just beyond it, it too is really well, um, almost completely eaten away. All the, all the needles have been eaten from it, that one there. There's another one over there that's a taller one that um, has a few, um, you know, still has some foliage on the outside, but it looks like it's almost dead too. So they're eating the hemlocks that are closest to their den. Um, That's very efficient. Yes, very efficient. They take the, you know, they, don't, they have to conserve their energy and um, body heat as much as possible over the winter. Um, so they, you know, obviously want to get the food that's closest to their den. Um, and hemlock is the food that porcupines pretty much only eat in the winter. That's their, by far, their main food in the winter. Occasionally you'll see them eating bark of some different trees, but that's much, much, um, a very minor food source. Yeah, we saw them eating a little uh, white pine up above their, their den. Yeah, occasionally they'll eat a little bit of pine bark, but I, I really think that's a um, secondary and pretty inferior um, food for them. When they eat hemlocks, um, well, maybe we'll be lucky enough to find some nip twigs somewhere. Um, they go out onto the end of the branch and they bite off the end piece, like right here. Right here you can see where it's been bitten off. Oops, I broke it. But here's the end where they, um, where they bit it off. It's at a 45 degree angle, like they just bit it like ah, with their chisel teeth. And, um, and then they stand on the branch and they, they eat it. And um, they only eat the little bits of needles at the end of each twig that are the most recent year's growth, because that has the most nutrients in it. The rest of it is not worth it. Uh, energetically or nutritionally for them to eat. So they leave those, and then this piece that they bit off, they just drop to the ground. And so you may find um, uh, hemlock twigs on the ground that still have needles on them. And you wonder, well, why did they waste all this food? If you look carefully, they've bitten off the ends of each of the little, um, each of the little twiglets here. They would bite those off and drop the rest. Those are called nip twigs. Nip twigs? Nip, nip twigs are the pieces um, that they drop to the ground. Maybe we can go down here and cool. find some. Say that three times fast. Nip twig, nip twig, nip, dip, nip, dip, dip, nip, nip, twig, nip twig. Nip twigs, okay. <laughs> Let's go down the, the trail a little bit. So here is an immense grouping of nip twigs. 
And you can even see some scat from the porcupine as well. Mm -hmm. Let's do this try this one that that one looks like it was just broken off. See how it's just kind of got a raggedy end to it? So I think that one just broke. Let's try this one. There, that one. Get it in the light. That has a nice 45 degree angle cut that was definitely bitten off, not just broken off randomly. So again, here's the twig with the little bits at the end. That one's been bitten off, that's been bitten off, that's been bitten off. If you go around every little twig at little at the end of each one of these little things has been bitten off. Every single one. And then they drop the rest of it because it's not efficient for them to get energy out of those old needles. And now for a nature nerd's quiz. If a porcupine was asked to play an old time cartoon character, which would be an easy role for him to play? Underdog. Mr. Magoo, The Pink Panther, or Dudley Do Right? If you picked Mr. Magoo, then you were correct. You see, porcupines are very nearsighted, almost completely blind. They cannot see anything stationary like trees and can only see movement at short range. Their hearing is very weak, but they have a keen sense of smell and sensitive facial whiskers to help them maneuver through the underbrush. This may be one reason why they keep to a very specific path over and over again. Take a look at this video. At first, we thought the porcupine was in trouble, but in light of their very weak vision, the porky is actually going in an outward spiral, a very efficient strategy to find a tree to climb. Good to see some good tail drag. Anybody want to peek with the binocs? You could use your glasses, actually. Right, but are you going to take them off? Yeah. Okay. Ready here? On my mitten, you see two porcupine quills. These are um, hairs from the porcupine that have, over over the course of evolution, have evolved to be those sharp pointed things. The white part sticks in the skin and the black part sticks out so that when a predator comes, the quills stick into the predator's nose or whatever and it goes away because it doesn't want to deal with that. But some, some people think that porcupines can shoot their quills, like get them to zoom out of their skin, but they can't do that. No. <laughs> they just so they're they're Whoa. hairs. Oh, oh. <laughs> John, help! Our porcupine is the only mammal in the United States that actually has antibiotics in their skin to prevent infections when they fall out of trees and get stuck by their own quills, and they fall out of trees fairly often. The color of quills can range from dark brown to light yellow, just like our hair. When the porcupine is up on the tops of trees, their quills can get bleached by the sun. Many times you can see porcupine with blonde highlights. The sharp quills easily detach from the porcupine and penetrate a predator's skin. They have backward facing barbs, which not only keep the quills in place, but move them deeper into the muscle fiber as the victim moves, sometimes an inch a day. When animals are impaled, they suffer severely. The barbs have been known to pierce the heart, arteries, lungs, even the optic nerve, causing blindness. Here's a porcupine trail coming up this, um, right up here, and they've left some drops of urine. They always, they seem to just dribble and dribble along the way where they're walking. Uh, now this looks like it's kind of crusted in there, but maybe I can smell it. Oh, from down the here. true test of a nature nerd. <laughs> That's the smell of a porcupine. What's, what does it smell like? We don't have smell-o-vision. It smells like a kind of a, um, 
hemlocky smell, like a resiny kind of. Um, uh, Ted called it kind of turpentiney. Turpentine, that's the word. Yeah. Yes. And you know what else is funny? I've noticed when I'm hiking with people, and it's a hot, sweaty day, and I'm hiking behind somebody that's really smelly and sweating, that they smell like a porcupine. <laughs> <laughs> so it's sort of that, in a way, it's an unpleasant smell, like sweat. But oh. I actually kind of like the smell. It's sort of like a... So if I go hiking with you and you call me Porky... Resinous. I know I need to go take a shower. Yes. <laughs> you can sometimes smell the... Um, in the fall, they like to go up in uh, oak trees and eat acorns, and they'll hang out up in this one tree for days and days. And I can sometimes tell I'm getting near one of those trees by just the smell. Ah. I can smell that smell of the porcupine urine because it comes down from the tree and just spatters around on the leaves. Wow. And so the scent is everywhere in the air. Yeah. So you can you can use your smell as well as looking for nitwigs. Now does that draw um, any type of predator? Yeah, it probably does. Um, the one predator that is really um, adept at getting porcupines is fisher, which is in the weasel family. It's an animal about that long, dark brown, um, short little legs, but a very good climber of trees, just like porcupines are. Um, and so we can go up the trees um, after porcupines or um, get them when the porcupine's on the ground. The way the fisher gets the porcupine is uh, underneath the belly of the porcupine there aren't any quills. And so the fisher just kind of um, circles around the porcupine and the porky keeps turning, trying to turn its back with its quills and its tail toward the fisher. Turn around, turn around, and the fisher's going around and the porky's trying to keep his back to the fisher. But eventually the porcupine tires out, and the fisher um, makes a lunge in there to the porcupine's belly, where oh. there's no um, quills. And that, you know, eventually would be how they kill the porcupine. Wow. Besides their urine and feces on trees, they also have a patch of skin on their back called the rosetta that generates a strong odor to warn off predators. The odor smells like body odor or goat cheese. When the porcupine is agitated, the smell becomes intense, warning the predator to stay away. This female porcupine figured out another way to fend off predators. Even almost blind, the infrared light of the remote camera set her off, spinning like a whirling dervish. I wouldn't want to get in the way of this one. Molly, how do porcupines make love? <laughs> Very carefully. Very carefully. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you want a serious answer? Yeah. Well, you know, um, as Ted mentioned, their quills are just hairs. And so they can um, relax their hairs or they can make them stand upright. Like when you get frightened and you're, um, you know, the... Um, hairs on the spine of your neck go up, yep. or you see the dog's um, ruff go up when they're growling. Well, they have that same muscle that does that, so they can make their quills relax or go up when they're threatened. So when they're making love, they, um, the quills are relaxed and down. And the, um, like I said, as I mentioned before, they're, they don't have any um, quills underneath on the bottom side, just on the tops. And so if the female is relaxed and her tail is, you know, her quills are down and relaxed, the male finds his way in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, probably because there's little porcupines all over the place, That's aren't right. there? But did you know that porcupines only have one young per year? Oh, wow. Yeah, um, just one young per year. It's really interesting. Not many mammals are like that. Um, and guess what a baby porcupine is called? What? A porcupet. A porcupet? Yep. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Mating takes place in the fall, and gestation takes over 200 days, almost seven months. That's very long for a rodent. Females provide all the care and are very devoted to their one porcupet infant. They stay close to their mothers. Mother porcupines do not usually defend their young, but have been known to care for them even after death. In one case, when a baby had fallen to its death from a tree, the mother came down and stayed by her baby's side for hours, waiting vainly for the baby to revive. They're That's born all... in the spring, um, in around May, 
um, just when the time of year when, when the buds and their, when their food supply is starting to become available in the spring. They love to eat uh, buds off of um, aspirins, for instance. It's one of the first things in the spring. And so the young is born in the spring, and um, it can't really climb trees very well yet. So it's, the mother hides it on the ground, um, maybe under a log or in some dense vegetation, while hmm. she goes off and, and eats food and stuff. Um, and she'll come back periodically and nurse, nurse the porky pet uh, throughout the day. And gradually the porcupine, baby porcupine, um, gets big enough and starts to be able to climb a little bit and can fo follow the mother a little bit. But it sticks with the mother through that first um, season and then in the fall is ready to go off on its own. Cool. So I think you can order them on online, can't you? <laughs> no, no, that's chia pets. Yeah, right, that's right, right, right. They look sort of similar, but green. <laughs> Well, that was the wonderful world of the porcupine. A big thanks to Molly and Ted, who took us out on the trail and shared their expertise with us. We tracked porcupine in all of the conservation areas here in Northampton. This is why, and this is very important, this is why you need to keep your dogs on a leash when you're out in the conservation areas. It's going to keep your dogs safe, and it's also going to keep our wildlife safe. Remember, you're visiting their homes. I also want to share a book with you, The Natural History of Western Massachusetts by Stan Freeman. You can pick it up at the Cup and Top in Florence. It's a wonderful book. It gives you all sorts of information about everything from geology to dinosaurs to our wildflowers, our wildlife, butterflies, snakes. You can, you can imagine. It's really packed with all sorts of really cool stuff for nature nerds. So until next time, take a couple of hours out of your hectic schedule. Come on out to a conservation area put your dogs on a leash, and go wild. Take care.